And yeah, there's a lot of depression in these slides, but I didn't come here to depress people. Um, I came here to help you find some gems. We're looking for diamonds in the coal pile, right? Um, maybe it's better if I stand on this side. And a lot of the slides are pictures. And a picture is a thousand words, so I shouldn't have to talk so much. Hopefully the picture will give you a very good idea of the environment. All right. Did you read that disclaimer? It means. OK, South Africa, we've got half the world's minerals, and we've got almost no one to mine them. 6,152 abandoned mines and counting. It's probably a record. Uh, maybe I got a week. Oh, there we go. Sorry, just delayed action. Maybe I'm going to have to stand here. Okay. Empire State Building. South Africa was NASA mission control for mining for almost 100 years. They set the record in 1961 for sinking a shaft in 31 days. And it was deeper than the Empire State Building was tall. And that was over 50 years ago. They kept on going. And in 100 days, the shaft was deeper than the tallest building in the world. And that's the kind of mining industry this country had. Um, Wilbur Smith wrote a book on it. Um, was it Paramount Pictures even made a movie of it? And they managed to get James Bond to play in it. So. That's how important and exciting South Africa was. By 1980, this country alone was almost 50% of world market cap. Pretty impressive. One country out of 200 and has the market cap of half the world's mining industry. Today, maybe it's two or three. Why did we have such a large market cap? Why were we so famous? It costs money to build mines. And you've got to give a return on that investment or you won't get any more. And for 100 years, South Africa gave a great return. The average was probably close to 14% in dollar terms. And yeah, it was jerky, but um, they paid a regular dividend. And it was like having a gold bond in your portfolio with a lot more potential upside than downside. So while the dividend did come down in the 70s and 80s, it really came down because the gold price went up and the shares were more exciting. They were generally, generally a gold share was pretty boring and dull. Boring and dull. But if they paid a 11% dividend or a 10 or eight or nine, that's a lot more than US government bonds were paying. This is how Maynard Keynes made his money. Okay, and the all share, that was the benchmark to beat. The all share here, because it was 50% mining, was averaging 11, 12% in dollar terms. So another good reason to invest. So even with sanctions in the 60s, with apartheid policies, with South Africa being cut off from a lot of the industries and banks in the world, investors were still happy to give this place money. And I was happy to leave the mining bit breaking the rocks and joining the financial services part of the stock exchange of South Africa. Um, companies still needed mining analysts. It, whether you like mining or not, it's 50% of the index, so you, you have to know what's going on. And it was possible to add alpha. Yes, it was volatile and cyclical, but a lot of this alpha was even added when commodity prices were quite flat. And even Mark Shuttleworth, as much as he likes IT and he doesn't like bricks and mortar, especially back then, realized it was such a great Rand hedge. And it was still possible to add alpha in the new millennium, but under very different circumstances. Mining was no longer a NASA mission control in South Africa. Um, gold production started falling, but not so much because we ran out of gold. It's because the gold price went up, and now it was profitable to mine low grade. You know, why, why keep looking for gold that's deeper, more expensive to get to, 
when the gold price was so high, you could mine all the medium grade gold, all the low grade gold. So that was some of the reason that our gold production started falling in the 70s. The price was so high that you could mine a lot of gold they couldn't before. In the rest of the world, you can see what they did in that red line. When the gold price was released from the Bretton Woods Agreement in 72, 73, and it went from 35 to 100 to 200, boy, the rest of the world really liked that. And all of a sudden, they could mine much lower grade than even we could. Now, what's disconcerting about this chart is look at all the money that the shareholders made. That's green, but the government made even more. And these are just direct mining taxes. They're not VAT. They're not payroll tax. It's not property. It's just gold mine tax, corporate tax. So when the gold price went up in the 70s, the gold intake alone, the, the taxes from the gold shares were almost a quarter to a third of the whole budget of the country. So the country really benefited from that. But look what happened in the new millennium. The gold price went up as high, it stayed up longer, and it's not even a blip. So you got to say, why is that? You know, why did this country and shareholders make so much back then, and now they're making nothing? And this has been a great bull run in gold. So what happened? Okay, dull slide. Who doesn't know this guy? Nobody will admit to not knowing him, right? The Isaac Newton of investing, right? He's got lots of rules. And I'd say his rules are pretty good, looking at his track record. One of his rules is, where are you on the curve? OK. If you look at this, it's, it sums up South African mineral production by value. So here's the minerals, coal, PGMs, gold, down to manganese, chrome. It's kind of a nice assortment. It's very diversified. There's the money we make, $9 billion from our coal. PGMs brought in $7 billion. Gold, you know, gold used to bring in 15 to $20 billion. Now we're down to five. Okay, $37 billion. Anybody have an idea? Is that good, bad, or medium? Like Warren says, where are you on the curve? Oops. Where you don't want to be is in La La Land. Chile. We all know where Chile is, that long, skinny, mountainous, dry, arid country on the coast of South America, inhabited by llamas and a few people with sombreros, ponchos. Chile alone, 40 billion from copper. That's more than all of South Africa's metals put together. So Chile has less than a third of the people we've got. And just their copper, and they mine other things. Just their copper is more than all of South Africa's mineral production. So we're not a giant. We're a midget, $37 billion. There's steel, and here's all the minerals, the main minerals. Precious minerals are 10% of the total, so you open that up. There's gold. We do 5% of 70. We do 3.5% of the world's gold. We do about 10% of the world's diamonds. PGMs were still big, 70% of production there, but we're not big compared to the rest of the world. Talks in trillions, we talk small billions. Now, it's not just mining that's shrinking here. The country's growth is shrinking. And what's telling about this graph is if you go back to the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, there was no commodity boom back then. Gold was stuck at 35 an ounce for 40 years. Platinum, we hardly mined any. The world didn't use much. And yet, you had flat metal prices for decades, and we had sanctions. We were the pole cat of the world, but we still staggered along at 4 or 5 percent growth. Now we got a commodity boom this millennium. Free trade, we're opened up to the world. They loved us for a while. Cheap interest rates, unlimited cash, and we can't even grow at 2%. <laughs>
government, they're growing, growing the debt out of control. Spending's almost out of control. Spending madness, 22 trillion since 94. You know, they talk about land, they talk about industry. The mining industry never produced these kind of numbers. You know, what the mining industry would give to have 5% of those numbers. So the spending madness, it's no longer a little shop of horrors. Now it's a mega city of horrors. We all know that, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but this is the environment that mining has to work in here. Everything's out of control, at least everything bad. And yeah, we started out the new millennium. We should have been ahead of Bulgaria, Lithuania, Romania, Slovak Republic. You know, what edge do they have on us? We're so well endowed. Natural resources all over. So we know. South Africa is just one big laboratory nowadays. It's got a 1.6 trillion R&D budget every year. They blow it all, trying out their all ideas. Policy and behavior falls from the top. Government, government policy, it's not helping mining at all. So where are we on the curve? Mines, people do die in the mines, but if you add up how many people die and how many people go underground, it's a lot safer being a miner than being a policeman. It's, that is about half the death rate of new circumcisions every year. Road deaths are 44 people a day. So it looks a hell of a lot safer if you're underground than if you're on the road. Here's what's hurting mining even more. 2,000 pieces of legislation since 1995. 3,000 policy changes. Okay. South Africa had 140 listed companies in 1990. Today, maybe 44. Okay, we got a lot of PGMs, six diversifieds, five gold. We used to have 65 gold, or at least 60, somewhere between 60 and 65 golds. So we have dropped a lot. Fortunately, we've got some ETFs of the metals. That's where I spend most of my time now, because the shares, there's too many factors against them, whereas the metals, even if you get the metal price wrong, the currency will probably counter it. So you got a lot less risk a lot more knows than unknowns on the metals, on the ETFs. So our Alzi 40, is it still a South African index? And the Resi is 24%, which is less than half what it used to be. But if you bore down in that Resi, Billiton really isn't even in the country. You know, I think they've got half a mineral sands project, maybe an aluminum smelter, maybe two but I don't think 2% of Billiton's market cap is in the country. Anglo's less than half. Sassel, maybe two thirds. So if you add it up, South African mining shares are probably closer to five, 6% of the LZ than they are 24. But that can work as a positive because it means 66% of the LZ is offshore, 80% of the resi is offshore. So it is still a Rand hedge. You can see most of the big mining companies like Glencore again. Yes, Glencore's got some assets here, but it is such a huge company, 77 billion, maybe five, six, seven percent of Glencore's in the country. In Billiton, we said maybe two, three, four percent. Anglos, you know, maybe 35, 40% of that. So these big numbers, when you buy the index, you get a lot of these big numbers, but it's overseas exposure. It's not South African exposure. And then the numbers start getting small quick. Okay, who doesn't know who this guy is? Okay, I knew Charlie before I knew Warren, but I'm a lot older than you guys. Everybody's got a boss, right? But Charlie's the guy, Warren says, he's my, my reality check. Um, he's kind of my reality check, too. And 
first rule of practical wisdom is understand how things work. He says, everything's always mysteriously a thousand times harder than you think. You know, I, I ponder if government would just read a little bit of Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett before they do something. Or hell, even read them after you do something. You know, maybe you can undo it. Just read them. Just don't have to read books on them. Just read some of, some of their rules. And mining is a thousand times harder than anybody in government thinks. And it's probably 500 times harder than the unions think. Like Charlie says, not dealing in reality means you're not going to do well. It's delusional. It's not good to face the world in a delusional way. Most businesses you look at, you think they're easy, but they're not. But governments don't seem to know that, or they don't seem to care about it. And that assumes you're an honest and competent government. South African underground mining is a nearly impossible business. Each company is battling, and it's inside of a dying industry. It's inside of an imploding country. It's definitely inside of a difficult world. So does that sound like investment? Charlie says he bought some copper once. He can't even remember if he bought the metal or the company. But I think he bought the company. But he says it was decades ago. He doesn't remember if it was Newmont or Rio's. So it shows mines aren't on his radar list or Warren Buffett's. Money is an orphan. It goes where it's welcome. Warren particularly avoids government legislation that's against investors. The only foreign country I know that Warren Buffett's gone to is Israel. Seems to like Israel, or does he just like the investments he's made there? I don't even talk about the country much. I think it's the investments. Now, America, is it a good place for investments? And even if you don't like the guy running it, and even if he's not on the right path, you know, is coal really a growth industry? You can say at least he's trying. And that's what investors look at. They want somebody on the same conveyor belt going the same direction. Even if you falter, as long as they think you're trying the same line that they're trying, they'll usually give you the benefit of the doubt. And yeah, he keeps trying. Maybe coal isn't the answer. And maybe dropping taxes isn't the answer, but at least he's trying. Uh, he's trying to bring investors to America, whereas we seem to be trying to drive investment away from the country. Warren's fourth rule, what's your benchmark? Well, we know what his is. He took on, was it five, six of the best hedge fund managers in the country? Uh, and he bought the index. And we know the, the result of that. He blew them all out of the water, every one of them. Combined, I think he more than doubled what they did in 10 years. But individually, there wasn't one that even came close to Warren by buying the index. So that's his yardstick, his benchmark. And that was a benchmark most investors have had for 100 years. So if they came to this country, they had to get better than that. And if it was going to be more volatile than that, it had to be a lot better. Okay, now Warren's done well since 19... What do you say, 85, 86? The S&P has really smoked the world. Now, I don't know if it's going to keep going, but Warren's not in a rush to get out of there. 10% per annum. That's total rate of return in dollars. As we know, earnings drive share prices. Not hype, not propaganda. It's earnings. Maybe these other things will drive the share price for a bit, but it's earnings that they're the underpin. They're the rebar in the concrete. Without earnings, your share can't stay up. And you've seen it with Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon. Eventually, earnings came through, and they're supporting those shares. Okay. We held our own against the Aussie in the 60s, 70s, a little bit of the 80s. We were definitely oversold with the new government here. The rest of the world was quite worried. But with the commodity boom, the, the rest of the world didn't care about our government. They wanted to be in a country that had all the commodities. Now that the commodity boom is over, they're asking, is that the kind of country I want to leave my investment in? 
Mining resources, yes, they were volatile, but look at that return. Good place to be until here. Now, maybe it was oversold, and this index is more world than South Africa now. So it has been a good run, about 100% run in the last two, two and a half years. But I suppose everybody here wants to know what's next. I'd like to know what's next. And you can see that was that was supported by earnings. You know, earnings went from 50 cents U.S. to four. That's eightfold increase in earnings in about 10 years. 800% increase in dollar terms. Good. And that's what a commodity run does, just like the previous one. But these are rare. I don't know. There's been a commodity run other than those two in the last hundred years. Now I can't see there being another myself. So earnings are responding, but where do they go from here? They're going to need higher commodity prices to keep going up. Resi versus the Aussie, yes, it held its own, even though it was cyclical. But here, that's quite a secular break. It's a long ways to get back. I don't know if it can do it or not. You know, it is an older industry, not just here, but in the world. So your total rate of return in the Aussie. You're back, if you bought here and stayed in, it's 10 years with about a zero return. Gold's even worse. Total rate, rate of return on gold, sure, if you bought anything in the gold index just before the gold price went up, but any holdings when the gold price came down, you know, it, it can't be considered as anything more than trading and speculative. <laughs> And why? Because the earnings aren't there. It's barely made any money in the last 14 years. In fact, look at the years it made losses, billions in losses. Yes, it did make some when the gold price went up in 2011, but those earnings didn't even last 18 months. And this seems to be ignored by the unions, the politicians, and everybody else. It's not ignored by investors. There's no earnings. There's no fundamental underpin. Platinum index, if the gold index is Hiroshima, this is definitely Nagasaki. This is total rate of return. That puts in dividends as well. Five, so you're back to 2,000. So anybody who bought at any time in the last 15, 16, 17 years has lost. And if you bought up there, you've, you've done more than lose. You're probably dead. And... Yes, no earnings. They're not even back to break even. So I was at a breakfast, a uh, platinum breakfast, about four or five weeks ago. The guest speaker was Gwedi Montosh. And as friendly as he is, I don't believe his feet have ever touched the soil here. Um, and he, we were talking to him about the industry problems, but he just says, I don't think they're as bad as you people are making out. But, you know, how do you get worse than losing money every year? Okay, what do we got? South Africa was the country with the world's most ambitious mines. Now we've turned it into the world's most destroyed industry without a world war. We're busy stripping and destroying mines. We're filling in shafts to make sure nobody else can go down there and get out the gold we've left. We still have 50% of the world's known gold and probably 50% of that 50% is in existing shafts and mines. So at today's gold prices, the way our industry was set up, they should be able to get all that gold, but there's no chance they can now. So even ex-mine managers, even part people who are part of the industry are taking part of stripping this and selling hoists for scrap, you know, it's, it is flat out criminal. They haven't got this one yet. That's about a 50 ton drum from a hoist. But notice how the Zama Zamas have already got the one from here and the one from there. You know, how does how do Zama Zamas take a 50 ton shaft from a hoist? I don't know. They're resourceful. So that's our radical new gold industry. 
an investor's dream? Well, that's what Jeff tells us. He says South Africa is still an investor's dream. But I think his idea of a dream is Major's idea of a nightmare and Buffett's idea. So yes, the world is happy producing at current prices. We're unhappy. Just like it didn't matter what the gold price was back here, we increased production. Gold price was flat from 1933 to 1973. The gold price went flat, 35 an ounce, and we increased production. Didn't matter what the gold price was. We were more efficient, we mechanized, we innovated. Now it also doesn't matter what the gold price is. We decrease production. Decrease production, decrease revenue. So we're making as much off our gold mines in real terms as we did in the late 20s, early 30s. We had a lot less people to worry about. Government's getting nothing out of it on taxes. Shareholders are definitely getting nothing. Employees, they continue to shed. And it's going to keep on doing that. What does Isaac Newton say? Uh, a moving object will keep moving until a bigger force stops it. Well, I don't think there's any bigger force going to stop closing a mine, so it's going to go to zero. And as that happens, we know our unemployment goes up. And it's not good when your unemployment goes up the same time as your population goes up. We know what happens when those two get together. So we've traded our gold mines for shopping malls, property shares, and casinos. Are we a sunset or a sunrise industry? Well, we all know gold is definitely a sunset industry. The rest of our mining, you can say the jury's out, but there's a lot of worrying indications that the same disease that befell our gold mines, they're going to be full. It's like if somebody in your family gets TB or cholera, you know, a good chance the other members are going to get it. What's killing our mines? Lots of things. For one, our electricity. You know, government had to build the world's most efficient utility in order to give the mines cheap enough electricity to go down three, four kilometers. You can't go down that deep with electricity that's in the upper decile or even the upper quartile. So yeah, we had cheap electricity so we could build hoists, refrigeration plants, air compressors, ventilation fans. But if the other factors weren't killing the gold mines, the electricity price alone would almost kill them. So ESCOM didn't come out of nowhere. You know, It was a conscious effort by government and some hardworking, very intelligent people, and they benchmarked on world standards. And the same was behind ISCOR. We needed cheap steel to sink those shafts. A mine underground takes a lot of steel, and you have to keep sinking shafts to access more ore. So you needed readily available, competitively priced steel. And the government helped fill that role too. But we know, fast forward, we've had a lot of experimenting going on. We know what happens usually when you experiment. So you wonder, does anybody really wonder whose side these guys are on? They definitely were not on the industry side, and it's pretty hard to believe they were on the country side. Anybody we thought was good didn't last. But Eskom's a sideshow compared to what's happened at Transnet and the harbors. Moving goods from our harbors to the interior it costs four to seven times what it costs in America. Now, bulk, we're not too bad. You know, the coal we move, the iron ore, we're kind of at world average, maybe a little above. But anything other than moving coal and iron ore, we're four to seven times more. Our ports are a third to 50% less efficient. Transnet, it hasn't hurt the mining industry as much as Eskom, but it's hurt the country as much or more than Eskom. The unions, are they helping the industry? Are they helping create jobs? 
And BE, sorry. This is four pages in the newspaper on one BE deal. Do you think Warren Buffett reads this before he buys? I'll guarantee you he doesn't. You know, Warren Buffett says if you can't write up your investment thesis in two or three sentences, he doesn't want to know about it. This is so complex, it's mind blowing. It doesn't attract investments and it doesn't give you a higher rate of return. And the problem is, what is this ownership really addressing? What is it really accomplishing? If eight out of 10 new companies go bust, if all of our gold companies and all of our platinum companies have lost 80%, how does giving somebody a share of something that loses 80%? And you know, there's cash calls, there's rights issues. So I'm not sure how this ownership is supposed to work. And I worked in the world's richest silver mines for quite a few years, in the late 60s, all through the 70s. I remember the silver price ran. The mine made a lot of money. We got overtime, we got bonuses, we got raises. I don't remember one or two miners out of hundreds that ever bought shares. They're not interested in ownership. You know, the miners have a lot more savvy than people give them credit for. They risk their life going underground. They drill a lot of holes. They blow up some rock. They want to get paid for it. They want to get paid that day because they might not be around the next day. They don't want to get a share that they work real hard and they put in the share and a year later they look in the share zero or it lost half. They want their money now. And I don't care what country you're in, every miner I've met thinks the same way. They're not fussed about this ownership. Yeah, they want bonuses, boy. And hey, if they drill extra holes, they want to get paid for them. But I don't know any miners, they've got too much common sense to get involved in the share market. You know, how many investors make money on shares? What's the ratio, Simon? Eight out of 10 can't even beat the index. And that's the top fund management industry. huh? So now they want 50% ownership in mining and they know most of the mining shares are gonna go down. Now, is that gonna make the communities happy? Imagine all the bees and lawn men. And that was a convoluted deal that Brian Gilbertson put together. Now, and lawn men's had two or three rights issues as well. We know the community didn't put any money in for a rights issue, but this is where their equity is. It's a friggin' zero. And what's Warren's seventh? One of his famous rules, you never borrow money to buy shares, but B is based on borrowing. So, it's really like government takes a textbook and whatever's proven that it works and is correct, they want to do the reverse. It's like they said, what do Warren and Charlie do in their investments? We're going to write a policy exactly opposite what they do. Now, maybe it's because we're south of the equator and government thinks everything works opposite here. I don't know. But it, it hasn't uplifted. It hasn't created jobs. It's made literally a few handfuls of people happy, but at the expense of tens of millions. So we got ideology, radical talk, slogans, and oh yeah, there's lots of bad guys. Radical Ramathodi. Everybody wants radical economic change, radical change in the mining industry. We all know about ideology and social engineering transformation. We've all heard it before. The struggle. My struggle, huh? it's not a new word. It's been in many languages for a long time. Never has a good end either. Hopefully our end doesn't get like this. And Jeff, he still says South Africa is an investor's dream. I don't know if that's Bridget with Jeff or who. All right, so we know the problem. We did a double cross here. We told the whole world we weren't gonna nationalize the mines and less than 10 years later, that's exactly what we did. So the world doesn't really trust us. And they, thrown in, they threw in some other things as well for good measure. The Labor Relations Act was passed before our constitution because it's so unconstitutional it wouldn't have held muster. Eskom price increases, union rivalry, populist, demigods, inadequate rule of law. Why would anybody wanna start a mine? Why would anybody want to invest in one? 
and we've even got Dr. Judge Davis with his tax and royalty. He wants to put mines on the same tax as IT companies that have no capital, no rules, almost no employees. Mines, you put your capital in the ground, 4Ks deep for 10 years, and he thinks they should be on the same tax rate. And it was only because we had a government that needed the jobs, needed the income, that they adjusted the tax rate to make it attractive to invest in these deep level mines. Now, Judge Davis wants to throw that out. So I suppose he just wants to throw concrete over the coffin just to make sure nobody gets an idea about opening a gold mine again. All right, we've had legislation and policies. They seem to be written around abnormal conditions that don't last, you know, like super tax, royalty, the money bill. But, you know, these are freaks of nature, freaks of economics. You write a, you know, Australia started writing a policy up there and the mines protested. They had meetings with the government. The government listened and the population listened and they took all that legislation away. It didn't even get passed. So they had enough savvy to realize, unlike the DRC now is trying to write super taxes on cobalt because the cobalt price is high and cobalt looks like this graph. All right, investing. If we start from today, the resi doesn't look too bad. You know, it's, it's long-term PE with the Indy is almost identical. <coughs> so trading at about a 35% discount. So if you buy the resi index today on a P basis, you're buying it at a pretty decent de discount. And that's what Warren Buffett likes to do. In fact, I think he only buys things at discounts because he says that's your insurance. Okay, on a price relative basis, yeah, it broke a cyclical trend of 100 years and it might not get back to where it was, but it does seem way too far below on a price basis. You know, it's outside of standard deviation. Major will buy anything if it's outside of standard deviation, and I'll usually sell anything if it's above a standard deviation. So on a PE and a price relative, the resi doesn't look too bad. <laughs> U.S. interest rates. Falling rates are supposed to be good for metal prices. It's funny it only kicked in in the new millennium, but there's a lot of factors that made it kick in here. You know, China's vociferous growth, um, low metal prices throughout two decades meant there weren't a lot of new mines coming on stream. South Africa was pulling mines off the market, not as much as other countries then. But rising interest rates, they're not necessarily good for commodities, but it depends. Are they going to rise faster than inflation? Okay, oil. Oil and gold... They have a rough correlation, but it does break down. So you can't blindly accept it. But what's been running the last couple months here are the energy prices. Oil going to 80. I never thought I'd see oil, oil at 80 again. Even more crazy is coal is now $102 at Richards Bay. Coal is public enemy number one, and it's gone from 60 bucks to 102 And even natural gas, which they usually have to give away, is, I think, almost a standard deviation above its mean as well. So energy prices are running, even though metal prices seem to be rolling over. But I still think reversion to the mean is quite powerful, and I can't see oil staying anywhere by 80. I gotta believe it's gonna come back to 50, 60, because everybody can make money at 50, 60. People are expanding production at 50, 60, especially the oil shale drillers. But gold defies all the odds. Gold continues to trade at double its long-term average. So maybe this is some kind of secular break with the past. I don't know, but it's, it seems rock solid. doesn't want to come below 12. Platinum's different. The market for platinum is much smaller than gold. And we have 70, 80% of the world's known platinum. And by our own doing... We expanded too rapidly. We opened too many mines. The government, after they nationalized all our resources, 
they gave away a lot of very rich platinum properties to outsiders. So a lot of factors have combined to make us overproduce platinum. And that's a big reason for this. It's not the only reason, but it's a very big reason, too much production. Um, the whole world produces maybe six, six and a half million ounces a year. In gold, anybody know how many ounces a year the gold is produced? Take a guess. Humor me. A hundred million ounces a year. hundred million ounces. And this country has more platinum than we have gold. And we have half the world's gold in the ground. So it shows how different the markets are. And Oppenheimer learned that years ago, like in 1905, 1910, 1917. That's why he started Anglo-American. He says, I can't handle these diamond prices. They're too erratic. I want a commodity that it doesn't matter how much I produce, doesn't affect the price. So if government was going to baby any industry, I wouldn't say the auto industry should be first in line. I would say gold, because it doesn't matter how much we produce the gold. But platinum is delicate. You know, world demand is maybe 8 million ounces. And two of that comes from recycling. And we have billions of ounces in the ground. So, you know, you got to really play this thing fine. And we're still producing too much, and that's why the price continues to fall. Okay, coal. Yeah, okay, but platinum, I told Simon, it's the first time I haven't been long. I usually have one or two Aussies. You know, if I'm bullish, I have 10 or 12 Aussies. I don't have one Aussie. But a lot of it's because I put half my pension fund into platinum. I was sure Lawnman was going to close or Impala was going to close or they were going to dramatically close some shafts. They just haven't yet. But I'll hold it. You know, I think the platinum ETF, you get a five to one gearing on it. Can platinum continue to fall relative to palladium? I can't believe it. Platinum is a much better metal than palladium. It does many more things that palladium does. So I don't know why palladium is trading pricier than platinum. And if I plot the platinum price to gold, it looks identical, except it's down to here. Platinum has never been this cheap to gold, ever. And gold is not that difficult to get out of the ground or refine. If you watch carte blanche, you'll see the nannies in Soweto. They're refining gold with pop bottles, mercury, and hammers. But I don't see any nannies refining PGMs. They're very complex, very expensive. There's 10 metals in that ton of rock that you have to separate. So I think platinum's day is coming. We just produce too much too fast. And coal, this is unexpected. Public enemy number one, it's over 100 a ton. But it shows the world needs it. It can't come off its coal power plants as fast as it needs to. But I, I do think this is um, temporary. But all the big companies are getting out of coal. Rio's has sold all their coal. Anglo's has sold probably a third. Not just here, but in Australia. Billitons sold a lot of their coal internationally and here. So as the big guys are selling, the little guys haven't been able to replace it quick enough. And I think it could stay up here for a bit, but the trend has got to be back down to a mean, back down to 60 bucks. Iron ore. I'll never know why iron ore even got above 90. I just, it's the fourth common element on the planet. Everybody's got iron ore. Some have a lot of high grades, some have medium, but everybody has iron ore. Um, this was totally ludicrous. This is crazier than any other commodity. And the big guys, the Brazilians, the Australians, they've got their cost down to $25 a ton. So even here, they're making 60% gross margins. You know, they're beating Microsoft and Google. And even South Africa, that has to haul up from Sishin all the way down to the coast, confidentially, they now have their costs below 40, 35, 36. So to me, there's just too much profit in iron ore for the price to go up. And base metals, yeah, they haven't gone crazy. You know, when you're about the mean, you can go either way. When you're above the mean, I know it's not going to last. And just like here, can't last. Everybody was losing money here. 
gold mine strike. That was the turn of our 100 year gold mine anniversary. That's when the miners took over and the mining houses knew it. I joined Alan Gray in 89. I went to visit all my friends at Anglos and JCI. I thought I was going to make millions. And they said, Peter, the era is over. We're not investing in any more shafts. We don't know what's going to happen from here on, but we don't have control over these mines. The unions do. And they were very right. Um, they could see they weren't going to be able to get a return on capital. They didn't know how low the gold price was going to go, and they didn't know what the new government was going to do. But we do know some things in life. Okay, Warren says diversification is the only free lunch you're going to get in investments. And Ernest Oppenheimer figured that out as well before Warren did, probably before Warren was even born. And that's when, after 20 years in diamonds, he says, I'm going for gold. I've got to diversify my asset base. Looking ahead, 2018. This is S&P 500 in real terms, and nothing scares me like this. We got a lot of scary things in our newspapers here, and I'm pretty frightened, but nothing scares me like this because the world does hinge on that, as we've seen times before. Um, it doesn't mean it's coming down tomorrow or next week or next month, but this is all-time high, and I, I didn't show the other graph. I should have put it in but it shows earnings look just about like that. Earnings in real terms are at an all time high. And you have to say when you're at an all time high, what's gonna drive you higher? You know, these big software companies, they're all on fat margins. Maybe they can get a few more customers, but geez, it's pretty unbelievable. Our market to the S&P 500, Historically, we're actually trading about 10, 15% above our mean. So relative to the S&P, we're not cheap. So if you think the S&P is pricey, then you're probably going to have to think this is pricey. What about gold versus the S&P? Okay, I couldn't factor in the dividends on this one, but it's, it's kind of neutral. You know, it's, it's pushing a standard deviation here. You know, if it was in the middle, I'd say stay away. You're always going to be wrong buying or selling something in the middle. So, yeah, it can fall more. But right now, I'd almost rather hold a Kruger Rand for a year than an S&P future. Okay, how's gold done relative to the Z 40? This is total return index. You know, it didn't embarrass itself until about the last five, six years. Now it's been on a trend, but it is below a standard deviation. So again, relative to our market, well, I've gone long platinum, I haven't gone long gold yet. How about the metal versus the equities? No contest, you know, from four to 30. That's a seven times multiple. So gold has really beaten equities. So if the gold price goes up, yes, equities will outperform, but only for a bit. You know, that, that initial jerk up, all of a sudden they'll be making some earnings. But they won't even get to pay a dividend yet. They'll pay the bankers back. The unions will ask for it. The government will ask for it. So I think this trend, it won't be that steep from here on, but there's not going to be many South African equities anyways, not in gold. And, yeah, this is a long-term picture of our index. It's lower than when I was in grade school. So Buffett and Munger, they did the right thing. They don't invest. When they invest, we know it's long-term, it's big holdings. Gold certainly didn't fit that. Okay, platinum. Interesting graph here. Platinum fell relative to the equities in the 90s and new millennium. And this is when the platinum price was very low. But it shows. They were increasing the number of mines, increasing shafts. And as you increase your production, you lower your overall cost. So our platinum mines were very competitive here. So when the platinum price turned, let's see here. What happened? They didn't outperform. 
This, yeah, let me go through this again. This is the platinum price versus the platinum index. So the metal fell more than the shares. But since 2007, the metal has gone up from three to 20. That's six, seven fold. So even though the metal has been falling, it's outperformed the shares by a factor of seven. To sum up, that's how bad the platinum shares have done. The metal is safer than the shares. All right, Warren will tell you everything has a value. It's, it's just what is the value, what is the price you're paying, and it's dependent on the time you're getting it. And yes, Anglos, it looked like Steinhoff here two Christmases ago. But Anglos had an asset base. Yes, it had $10 billion debt, but one of its Australian coal mines alone was worth $15 billion. So if you got one mine, and I think they had seven or eight mines in Australia, and they had seven or eight here. They were all good mines. Anglos never had bad assets. They had De Beers. The Chinese were offering them $10 billion just for their De Beers holding. So this isn't surprising, but this was surprising. You know, that the market shoved them down that hard that fast. Glencore, it also got shoved down hard and fast. And Ivan, Ivan Glassenberg had rights issues here, and he made all his employees follow the rights issues, where he got fired. It's pretty unprecedented. But he's the biggest shareholder. His employees are the second biggest shareholders. They knew what the company is worth, and it was a trading company slash mining company. So even if commodities went almost to nothing, he was still making a lot of money just trading them. So it's, it's a pretty safe share to be in. Arm, they're not great. They're nothing like Anglo-American, but look at this. 5.4% capital gain, 2.2% dividends, 7.5% in dollars. You know, it's better than a US long bond. And that's still coming off, you know, it's still pretty low there. So there's value in commodity shares, but geez, they're cyclical. Timing's everything. DRC destroyed their mining industry, then they resurrected it. How and why? Regime change, policy change. This was an amazing story. Tens of billions of dollars went in there. Now they want to change it again. Zambia did the same thing. Chile, they also had a policy and regime change, but theirs was for the better. They improved on something that was good. They were producing the same here as the DRC in Zambia. But what did they do? They went up tenfold. South Africa, well, we're going to need a policy change if we want to get our copper going up again. This is what you get for a ton of our ore out of a gold mine. People say the grades are falling. Well, you're still getting the second highest, getting $230 for every ton of rock you bring up, even today, with our low grade, because the gold price is high. So it's not a ton, it's not a grade problem, it's not a price problem. It's a productivity problem. Ounces per man is where it was in 1908, 1907. No productivity increase. Even the rock they bring out of the mine is, and we got loaders, dump trucks, drill rigs. So we, we're in a time warp. Our coal industry has gone backwards as well. It's not just gold. The U.S. coal industry, yes, it's jerky. And a few years ago, we were getting four and a half, five in 2000. Oh, they were getting it and maybe, you know, we were only 10, 15 years behind them, but now... We're in a completely other universe. We're only opening open pit mines. We like them because they're more destructive and they don't employ people. We're closing our underground mines. Oh, yeah, and they had too much local content. Nobody's helping us. All these saviors and leaders, more legislation's better, high costs, fighting, Nobody's getting along. Even the unions don't get along. Blueprint. What matters to most South African is jobs. That's all. 47, 50% they want jobs. They want to get out of poverty. 
You don't even see land here. Oh, there's landless. Yeah, 1%. You don't see racism here. It's politicians creating all that. There's lots of ways we can get out of this. Focus collaborative efforts. Peru did it. Peru puts out more copper than Zambia and DRC together. Who's Peru? They got less people in Chile. There's lots of ways of improving things, but it's called gradual. One improvement at a time. If it doesn't work, you back up and get rid of it. The Americans did it 150 years ago. That green is all they could build after three years of construction, that green. And then they did something different. They got rid of job reservation. They brought in meritocracy. And there were Chinese and there were blacks from this Civil War. In the end, right near the end, 16 kilometers of track in one day, all by hand. We know Transnet can't do that in a month. We got to get rid of nepotism, corruption. We've got to bring back meritocracy, productivity. This is what we've squandered. Yeah, we squandered a lot of that too. So in my mind, it should be easy to make tomorrow better than today. Peter, as always, thank you. It's a world record. Folks, I'm going to pop it down there. There's some questions, but I appreciate the time. I appreciate some people wanting to get back into traffic, avoid an airplane to catch. I'm sure Peter can spare us a minute or two thereafter. Uh, I appreciate your time. We've got a power hour coming up back in Cape Town in a couple of months. Next week, we're in Joburg, uh, Keith McLaughlin, looking for quality stocks. Uh, probably not in the mining space so much, maybe. But if you guys are done here, you can catch the webcast, you can catch the video the day after. My appreciation to you for coming to this evening. Peter, as always, really, really thank you. Welcome.